Building your listing program is not unlike building a house. You need a plan and an experienced architect. What we are laying out really is this idea of kind of the architectural programming, figuring out what customers need, you know, what requirements they have, and then developing the plan that they can then take and execute. Carefully planning your CX listening house on this episode of the CX Leader Podcast. The CX Leader Podcast with Steve Walker is produced by Walker, a business consulting firm that helps our clients unlock the potential of their customer experiences by placing the customer at the heart of all their business decisions. You can find out more at walkerinfo.com. Hello, I'm Steve Walker, Chairman and CEO of Walker Information and also the host of the CX Leader Podcast, where we explore the topics and themes that are helpful to CX leaders like you who are leveraging the benefits of their customer experience to create competitive advantage and helping your customers and prospects want to do more business with your company. We're now in the second part of our three episode series on customer listening architecture. And as you'll learn in this show, driving it without a plan can be risky. You need to have a plan and you need to know what you're doing or the house could collapse and you realize you're down the road and you might not have the funds to even finish its construction. I want to welcome back Dr. Troy Powell, frequent guest on our show and also our resident PhD here at Walker, vice president of our consulting group and an expert on designing customer listening strategies. He's going to talk about the approach to planning and your listening architecture. Troy, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, Steve. Always a pleasure to be here. So, Troy, um, you know, a lot of people don't know this, but you are a native of the state of... I am an Alaskan. You are an Alaskan. <laughs> you know, I, isn't the population of Alaska still like less than a million people? Yes, I think it's, I think it's up around 600,000 now. Yeah, so it's uh, smaller than our moderately sized city here of Indianapolis. Yes. Yeah, spread over a size of basically two and a half Texases. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, I actually had the opportunity to go there uh, in 2009, uh, and it is spectacular. Uh, I would... It, you know, everybody ought to have Alaska on their bucket list. So, uh, yeah. but back to the topic of customer listening architecture, enough on geography <laughs> this morning, but we talked about this analogy of building a house and you have an Alaskan story that I think people <laughs> will resonate about. And it really provides a nice analogy to this whole topic. So why don't you give us the Alaska house story? So there is one house, and we reference this in the webinar that you can check out as well, this house called the Goose Creek Tower, or more affectionately known as the Dr. Seuss house. It's this tower that this gentleman built, um, you know, a little bit out from Anchorage, about two hours from Anchorage. And he started it out as just a normal two-story house. And, but the story actually goes that he built the house after a forest fire, and he wanted views of Denali, which is you know, the big mountain. Well, as the trees started growing back, he realized he needed to keep adding on to the house to get a better view. And then it kind of took on a life of its own, and now it's ended up being you know, around 10 or 12 stories. Nobody's quite sure how many stories because of the way it's just cobbled together into this tower. And so my dad was the state fire marshal up there for a while. And so part of his job was enforcing building codes. Um, And so this gentleman was actually a lawyer in Anchorage who built this house. And so there was a continual process of, you know, saying, hey, this isn't quite up to code because half of the stuff there is no code for (laughs) that he was doing. Um, But if you look at the picture, you will see there's all this um, kind of latticing around the various stories. And there is quite a bit of um, additions to it to try and make it safer uh, to be habitable. Yeah, for our listeners, you need to check out uh, the Goose Creek Tower story. Put it into your browser and, and check it out. Uh, there's actually a short video, and I do not envy your dad <laughs> dealing with that guy because he looked a little eccentric. Yeah, which again happens quite a bit up there. <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, you know, in the other story, it's not nobody is living in it. And I don't know how if anyone ever did actually live in it or if it was just always under construction and and now it's just kind of fallen in disrepair a little bit. And that might be an analogy for a customer listening program that needs a little uh, design work, huh? Yeah, so I think it's a great corollary because we actually do see often these voice of customer listening programs that 
really are just sort of layers upon layers upon layers. You start with something thinking that it's going to be what you want and what you need. Um, but then you, know, you realize, hey, you know, certain part of the business wants some additional information, so let's add a section to it. And oh, we're not reaching uh, part of the population well, so let's you know, kind of cobble on uh, another sample source. And you know, it's something that eventually does start looking like this you know, Coos Creek Tower, or I think I said in the webinar, this Franken survey, <laughs> where you're just you know, kind of cobbling pieces Hashtag together. Franken survey. <laughs> And, and you know, it ends up being something that nobody really can use it was as, as it was intended and often becomes abandoned by the business because it's something that's just too crazy and cobbled together, I guess would be the right word there. So I think it, it really does set up the fact that, you know, you want a plan going in and then that plan is always going to change over time, right, as, as your business shifts. And the important aspect is thinking about, Okay, well, not how do we just make this one thing meet everybody's needs, but the ability to be flexible to deploy surveys in different parts of the business and still be able to get those insights brought together in some way. We had uh, Allison Grayson on the show last week, and and she laid out sort of the uh, stages of this process. Mm -hmm. But if folks really want detail on that, I suggest they go listen to that podcast. But maybe you could lay out for the listeners sort of how you would use that process as an architect of your mm-hmm. customer listening and put that into practice. We debated a lot about the name of this, like what do we call this system, this program. And and architecture, you know, one, it's got some cachet, right? You, know, you mm-hmm. think Frank Gehry and Frank Lloyd Wright and, you know, all these yeah. s- semi-famous architects that – in architecture, for some reason, within at least in the U.S. culture, is uh, you know a profession that uh, people think is kind of cool, right? Yeah. If you remember Friends, Chandler Bing and Friends, that was his go-to like fake job to try and impress people was that he was an architect. Right? <laughs> I think George Costanza was an architect <laughs> oh, yes, too. Oh yeah, and George at one Costanza, time. You're right. <laughs> so yeah, so you see it quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. It does have this cachet. It's you know it's almost yeah. like being an artist. Art Vandalay. <laughs> that's that's who George. <laughs> yeah. He's an architect. Architect Art Vandele. Yeah. <laughs> and yes, and it's, I think, something where it's almost like being an artist, but yeah. you do something practical and pragmatic and, yeah. you know, actually get, probably get paid better on average. Um, <laughs> so, so there was that aspect. It just kind of had a nice ring to it. Um, but there's also the fact that what we are laying out really is this idea of kind of the architectural programming piece, which is this design piece of figuring out what customers need, you know, what requirements they have, and then developing kind of a sketch or a plan that they can then take and execute and bring in the right people in that execution and kind of building phase. Um, so you know, those are really the three steps that we want to want clients to go through is this requirements part where we're really helping them figure out what is that their business needs to know from customers and what do we need to collect where does it need to go who is it that needs that information to act and develop a better experience for the customers Um, then sketching out this plan and getting the feedback and then creating something that you can then implement over usually we look at trying to implement it over a three-year time frame and saying, okay, what do we do now versus what can we stage into down the road? And, you know, and that then takes you into kind of the execution or what would be in the architecture term or the, the building phase where you start building out kind of the blueprints and the construction documents and bringing in the subcontractors and the teams that are necessary to, to really put it into play. And so what we want to really focus in on is this first piece, these requirements and planning phase to get them to the right phase that they can then execute and build something that will serve purposes of the company and last for a long time. Yeah, let's talk a little more about that uh, requirement stage. I know you particularly feel that this is a place where we could have a lot of impact with our clients based on our broad experience with lots of different companies and lots of different custom houses for customer listening that have been built. So why don't you talk a little bit about that plan making stage and and why it's so important to be collaborative? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, this requirements piece leading into planning is really important as well of, you know, understanding what you're planning for is 
important. So my, uh, my sister-in-law is actually an interior designer for a commercial architect and design mm -hmm. firm. You know, and it's interesting hearing her stories of you know, how much time it takes. And they'll develop you know, two or three different kind of ideas based upon initial interviews with the customer. Um, and then you know, and get a sense of who they are, what they do. Do they have other space you know, that you need to match it to? And then they'll develop a few options and take it to them. And you know, often they're like, well, I like this piece of this, this piece of that. You know, and it's this process of getting to, okay, here's what we want. And then they go into the detail of, of setting it forward. So that you know, upfront requirements is really important. And in, uh, in the CX space, you know, we do think there's two pieces that are really important to have before you go into planning. And you know, that's the journey map. Understanding the customer's journey is pretty critical. And another piece is kind of the CX design, um, which is kind of a, you know, a newer term, but is really the idea of, of an organization sitting back and saying, what is the experience that we want customers to have? So, right, it's you know, almost a little bit like the brand work that you know, was done 20, 30 years ago, this idea of a company should should have some brand images, some things that they get associated with, we think that the customer experience needs to be the same. Yeah. Um, so having those design principles is also very helpful heading into planning. Yeah, actually, I have thought that CX is sort of the manifestation of brand marketing for the current economy. You know, you can kind of get away with just a brand image when you have a fast-moving consumer product. Mm -hmm. But most B2B products involve elements of service, solution, and perhaps even multiple products that interact with other products. Right. So really, that design, it has to pervade the whole organization. And that's why this, you know, architecture concept mm -hmm. is so, so critical. You know, we're seeing from all different sources the idea of, of companies and executives seeing that uh, differentiation on the experience is kind of the future. I think it's always been true. We just haven't ever really identified it. it really always has been the experience that is differentiated. Yes, the product can get you a head start, but you know, eventually people catch up and copy products, especially. Absolutely. And it's, so that just is happening faster. And so it's becoming more clear how important the experience is. But, but as a result of that, you know, you're right. You think branding the product was critical and important. And, you know, what is the box that the iPhone comes in? How does it make you feel? You know, and, and those things are still, I think, important. Um, but it's now, I think, moving into that experience phase. What is it when they interact with your support? What do you want them to walk away thinking? Not just, right. hey, I got my problem solved. Obviously, that's critical. <laughs> but you know, how is it that you want them to think of you? And how do you want that to differentiate you from your competitor? When we were getting prepared for this, you were talking about a, a case study where somebody has really done this this very, very well mm -hmm. in recent. So could you uh, speak to that a little bit? Yes. Just uh, link this architecture concept, the analogy of the house, to somebody that actually put together some customer listening mm -hmm. architecture. Yes, and I think that, you know, this, this move from requirements into then the planning phase, what we're seeing is how critical it is to have that be a collaborative process as you're moving into the planning. You know, we've done it a lot of different ways. And in some cases, you know, we've done it where we take this, all the learnings from the requirements and step back and kind of create the architecture plan and turn it over. And a lot of companies do actually like that. You know, they can say, hey, you're the experts, you tell us. But then there's been other cases in this one you know, recently where we actually said, well, let's do this requirements and let's actually do some of that collaboratively. But, but when it comes to building the plan, let's just all get in a room. So their team, our team, and spend a couple days in kind of a design process where the team really uh, engages and develops this plan themselves with our help and with our facilitation. And you know, what we saw in that case particularly is that it was kind of painful as any of these you know, collaborative <laughs> design processes can be. Uh, but at the end of it, you know, they had developed something that was just stamped all over with their organization's DNA, right? I mean, it, it 
used their terminology, it had their ideas, addressed specific issues that they had heard from their uh, stakeholders. And, and it was something that that team really believed in because they had been key to putting it together. When they would get feedback as they were shopping this out to their you know, stakeholder group, they could respond to that feedback in a lot of detail. Say, well, here's what we were thinking when we put that in place. And then the stakeholder could react, say, okay, oh, well, you know what, that makes sense. Or, well, I still think maybe we should tweak it. And then, you know, they were, they had the ownership to tweak and change based on that feedback. And then they really took this ownership of putting it in play because it was kind of their thing. It wasn't just something that some consultants had handed them. Right. And then when that gets questioned down the road, they're like, yeah, I don't know what they were thinking. Let's just shelve, you know, that whole idea. Um, it's something that will become a living document that this organization can use and, and create from and adapt over time, which is really, really critical. So, so we think any kind of plan, there needs to be a collaborative piece even there where you know, we work with the team, adapt it to their terminology, you know, make it something that they buy into. Um, and that way it can become this living plan that actually stays in place. Yeah, it's a classic case in uh, driving change is uh, yeah. people are a lot more likely to want to uh, change things if they feel like part of it's their idea. Mm, exactly. And, uh, all right, now maybe the other side of the coin. Where have you seen the uh, Goose Creek Tower getting built or the Franken Survey emerging? What are some of the characteristics of that? And, mm. um, and what might a CX professional do with that? I tend to see that happen the most in organizations where a uh, voice of customer has become a score or, you know, where it's just become something that people are used to seeing and, you know, and maybe even something where they've put some uh, skin in the game, you know, they put some incentives around a score, uh, you know, which personally I'm not a fan of, but I understand the idea of yeah. it, right? I think uh, there was a time when it was was real helpful, but I'm yeah. not sure that that time is that time may have come and gone. Right. Yes, and in, and in those cases, you know, it, it does tend to be something that it gets focus, right, and that's right. good, but often the wrong kind of focus, and so you get a lot of complaints like, oh, well, the score is not right because of this or that. Okay, well, let's tweak it. it becomes something that no longer serves a benefit other than to produce a score. And it's also a place where the people running the CX, um, you know, and the, and the voice of customer have tended to become just uh, program managers. And there isn't necessarily a strategic leader who is thinking, all right, how can this actually serve to affect change? How can it make us more customer-centric in how we act, not just how we talk? With those organizations, we really do suggest rethinking the team. You know, how do you structure it? And that's usually where we get brought in is when there is a more strategic you know, leader that's kind of brought into that organization. Like, hey, we need to rethink this. With the explicit um, blessing of the executives that you can blow this up. Because often we'll get into discussions, but then when it comes time to kind of cut that Franken survey apart and, you know, built something else, we'd be like, oh, no, you can't touch that. You know, that's, that's the golden goose there. You know, you can't create a new space unless you demolish part, at least part of the old space when you're re refurbing a building. And so it's kind of the same idea here. You have to be willing to break some stuff to get to a better spot. My guest today has been Dr. Troy Powell. He's a PhD and vice president of consulting here at Walker, and he's also the Franken survey hunter. Uh, if you've got a Franken survey out there, you may want to talk to Troy. Troy, how could they get a hold of you? Yeah, so um, I'm on LinkedIn. I am also on Twitter. I'm at T.A. Powell. And you also can uh, email me directly, tpowell at walkerinfo.com. And you know, we can schedule some time to, to have a little chat if you want. Thanks. And if you want to talk about anything we've discussed or any of the series that we've done on uh, customer listening architecture, or for that matter, any other topic we've explored here on the CX Leader podcast, uh, I hope you'll get in touch with me, steve.walker at walkerinformation.com, or call me at 317-843-8890. Uh, Don't hesitate to reach out to Troy, myself, or any of the other fine people here at Walker. We'd love to talk to you about your customer experience, and particularly your customer listening architecture. If this is your first time listening, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. Go to walkerinfo.com slash podcasts. 
and uh, see all the episodes. You can also subscribe to the podcast via iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Uh, really excited about the listenership and appreciate all your support. And on our show notes page for this episode, we have a link where you can check our recent webcast, Building Your Customer Listening Architecture, where Troy and our partners at Qualtrics discuss this topic in detail. And just for fun, we've included a link for you to check out some photos on the Goose Creek Tower. You don't want to miss that. Thanks for listening to the CX Leader Podcast, which is a production of Walker. We're a business consulting firm that can help you make customer experience your biggest competitive advantage and help you put the voice of the customer at the heart of every business decision you make. Find out more at walkerinfo.com. Thanks for listening to the CX Leader Podcast, and we'll see you next time.